Hello, everyone. Welcome to Momentum Boost. I'm your host for this evening, Adrian Gold Davis. And I really want to thank you for choosing to join us tonight. And it's going to be worth your while because I'm sure it's not just me. We are drowning in stress. So a couple of weeks ago, I made this post on Facebook. I said, if you could ask a therapist, a relationship therapist, anything at all, you didn't have to pay for the appointment that Momentum would pay for it especially about family-related stress, what would you ask them? So tonight, family systems therapist, Avram Nadigal is joining us for an Ask Me Anything style boost to answer all of those tough questions that you sent in to me about unhealthy family dynamics, about mental health struggles, and about loving each other through all the anxiety and through all the uncertainty. So remember, if you want to ask our guest a question, you just go right ahead and you type it into the chat box that you're going to find on the right. Now, joining me tonight is Avram Natigal, MSW, BCOM for over 20 years. Avram has worked with individuals who fear commitment, gridlocked couples, parents who worry about their teens. Now, informed by the Bowen family systems theory, he has learned what works and what to avoid to foster deeper, meaningful relationships. And he shares these lessons in his three books and his amazing podcast called Pop Parenting and his workshops. It's such a pleasure to join him. There are so many questions. Welcome, Avram. Adrian, pleasure to be here. Oh, boy. I know we said it's only a half an hour, but um, there are enough questions for three full days without you getting any sleep. Obviously, this is a, a difficult time for most people. And the questions came in fast and furious, some of them too personal, perhaps to answer here in a public setting, but many of them had a kind of a theme. And I, I would imagine that doesn't surprise you that when it comes to family dynamics, there are certain themes that play out over and over. So what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, is just start with one of the questions that I archived from that Facebook post. And then we'll take it from there. We'll riff on that. We'll see where it leads us. And we'll get to as many as the questions as we can. Does sure. that work for you? Yeah, great. Okay, I'm going to read the first question. Let me see. All right. How do we balance the concept of radical acceptance of my child, who he, she, they are, their traits, their genetics, et cetera, versus helping them to change behaviors and learn skills to help them cope and succeed. Sure. You know, Adrian, could we just start from the beginning of the beginning? I think that, you sure. know, the questions that were coming in on Facebook, I read them. Um, oh, good. And, uh, there were a lot. Uh, you know, I think something happened during COVID, and we spoke a year ago about yes. this, right? We, we were talking about where were things going to go, and it's been a year. Um, and I think that COVID did something to a lot of families <clears throat> with respect to removing support systems that are we've just come to expect family gatherings if there was a funeral there was a way you had a funeral if there was a wedding there'd be a way you had a wedding if there was a birth there'd be a way you had a birth and all of those rituals and all of those customs were upended uh and i think that in in one way we had a lot of togetherness stuff with the if you have kids and your parents, everybody was under the same roof together a lot, locked down, right? Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, there was a lot of distance and disconnection from extended family and, and what have you. And I, I think that um, that very unnatural sort of too much of one thing and not enough of the other thing right. had a tremendous, tremendous impact on families. I don't think we'll have a clear sense of where this goes for a couple of years until we really have a good sense of what all this means. But I just got a sense from the questions that were being asked on, on the Facebook post that yeah. you uh, that you posted. There just seemed to me to be a, a tinge of um, the you know the aftershocks of what we have just uh, been through. I, I don't know if you felt that uh, with the questions, but uh, well, you say that sociologically, we're going to have to wait a couple of years before we see how this plays out. But it's interesting when you said, you know, we some of us went from in incredible enmeshment with our families to complete distance. And some of us went from distance to they're all moving back into the house. 
So, you know, two sides of a coin that can have its own inherent problems, I would imagine. So do you think that COVID has exaggerated existing system issues within families and that things are disproportionately exaggerated because of those radical changes? That's a, that's a great point, actually. Um, I would say I have learned two things. And these are just clinical observations, Adrian. I don't have any research to back this up. It's all too new. Again, we'll find this out two, three years from now. Okay. My clinical observations are the following. I have clients who discovered a strength as, an, as individuals and in their family that they did not know have. I'm thinking of like, you know, clients of mine who, um, you know, are prone to get very panicky around illness, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea of COVID really freaked them out um, at the beginning. And then they got COVID. And then they tapped into an inner strength that they had to, you know, uh, hold it together for the kids and this and that. And when they came out on the other side, they never knew that they had that type of resolve and that resiliency. Um, and and it that will stay with them going forward for other challenges. I've had other clients, of course, where um, their entire livelihood was wiped out within, you know, a few months because of the industry they were in. Sure. Um, and it it showed uh, cracks in a, in a foundation that when they were successful, you didn't have to look at. But now that that was removed, it's like this outpouring of stuff that was always there, sort of touching on what you're talking about. I've seen both. Mm. Well, I'm wondering, you know, you seem to allude to something, and maybe I'm just imagining it, or maybe I'm remembering from our conversation a year ago. But I remember you alluding to the idea that as the parent's anxiety level goes, so the family is impacted. So if your clients have been impacted one way or another, that the, the overflow of what they're feeling is going to impact their children. So when it comes to the stress and the anxiety that families are feeling and all of these questions that are coming in, is it top down? Is it the parent's responsibility to manage their emotions in order to prevent their children from acting out? Or do children sometimes act out and it has nothing to do with their parents. I mean, one of the questions here is, my whole family says I'm the cause of their stress. You know, we see there, there are millions of questions about what other people impact them. But do you believe that the dynamic with the parents, whether they're a, 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 an, a couple, whether they're divorced, whatever it is, do you still feel that that has the greatest impact on the stress level of the children? Yeah, I mean, look, there, there's a general feeling, at least amongst my colleagues in the family systems world, that whenever you talk about trauma, everyone thinks we're talking about the same thing, right? You know, that you get 20 people in a room and they go, ah, this event would cause trauma to anyone who experienced it. The research and the clinical observations that we see with families just doesn't bear that out. Uh, so what we do notice, it's not the event that causes what people call trauma, but the way the family responds and adjusts to whatever the event is. Can you give me and, an example of what that looks like? Can you sure. Give me some example. Sure. So, you know, I have been privy to watch. Um, and when I say privy, I don't, I, I, this sounds almost positive. I mean, I, it's, it's an honor to sit with my clients and, and watch them go through what they go through. And I learn a lot just by, you know, being part of that process. I have seen families lose their family business okay mm -hmm. um and the way the way they are still connected to extended family and the way that there's an openness in the system where it's not secrets and closed and and um a, you know alliances with some members and other members are on the out and that the family adjusts now they go through a really tough time there's crying and there's frustration and there's fear but they get through it and they and these families have a nimbleness to them that they they pivot and they adjust and they grow and they move on they mourn what was but they move on i've worked with other families where you know netflix goes down and the whole family falls apart i mean they don't you know i mean everything just you know blows up and i, I i'm being a little you know 
I'm being a little exaggerated. I'm sorry, here, but, but during COVID, Netflix blowing blowing up is a huge issue. It, look, I mean, you, you 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 remove a distraction from a family that depends on entertainment to avoid dealing with each other, and that's going right. to be a big thing. So I I, I think that um, that COVID exposed some of some of these these things, uh, and um, again, I, I just think it's very important to understand that the event isn't nearly as important as a response to it. Your point, Adrian, that a parent's anxiety or how worried they are, where that worry goes towards a child, and this could be, by the way, for a teenager or a young adult, mm -hmm. someone in their 50s, mm -hmm. has much more to do with the outcome of how that kid is going to do in life than whatever clinical diagnosis they have from a psychiatrist or whatever the case may be. It's about the anxious focus on the child and the amount of anxious focus that goes towards a child, not the issue or whatever the uh, diagnostic criteria is. Whew. So let's say, for example, you have a child that has ADHD, just for argument's sake. Right. And one parent is for whatever reason finds that an impossible diagnosis to live with is is nervous about it his catastrophizing that this child will never be able to get through school will never be able to go to college will be living in their basement for the rest of their lives that kind of stuff that reaction has an impact on the performance of the child or on the emotional state of the child which one well, I mean, it's both, but actually that's a great uh, example because I, I see that quite a bit. Let's take two parents, Adrian, parent A, parent B. They both have kids. They're both, let's say they're both 16, just 16 okay. years old. And the 16 year old gets a, a you know, they, they're, they're brought to their family doctor. The doctor sends them to a specialist and they get diagnosed with ADHD. Parent A never heard of ADHD. They never experienced ADHD. They don't know. They don't even know how to respond to it because they've never really dealt with it. Okay. And they're worried and they're anxious. They don't know what it means exactly, but they're open to working with a physician to get the best supports for their kid. The kid's a little, you know, anxious. They don't know what that means either, but they work with the physician and the whatever the social worker, whatever the case may be, to muster up the resources to, to help this person. Parent B, parent B failed uh, grade nine right, was brought to a whole bunch of subspecialists in the 1960s when they, there wasn't an ADHD thing, tried different medications, was brought to this psychiatrist and that psychiatrist, and they left the experience with this, both a bitter taste in their mouth and also a dread that if this, I will not let this happen to my kid. You know how we leave our families of origin, Adrian, and we say, I will not do this to my kid. And what people, what, what, what people miss is, it's not what you do or don't do with your kid that causes the problems. It's the energy you bring into it. So when you, when their kid gets diagnosed with ADHD and their brain goes, I got to save my kid. I got to protect it. We are going to get the best, you know, the best. And so they bring into the doctor's office reams of, you know, studies from, you know, WebMD and, and, yeah. and they're fighting the physician on the, and the kid's sitting there like, you know, the kid's 16 watching all of this energy. Now, from the parent's perspective, they love their kid. Let me be clear. Parent A loves their kid and parent B loves their kid. It's not about love. It's about the amount of anxious, worried focus on that child. Parent A's kid is going to do better in terms of being open to different strategies in this versus parent B's kid. It's not about love again, but it is about that worried, anxious focus. And what's going to happen, Adrian, and this is fascinating, the child for parent B is going to become more oriented towards mom or dad's anxiety and less focused on what they have to do for them. And so they become more oriented towards sort of regulating their parents' anxiety. And I, this is, you know, Adrian, young people in their mid twenties, late twenties, I work with where they're really struggling with how to pick a partner, right? To marry and what kind of job they want. They've spent their whole lives oriented towards regulating their parents' worry and anxiety oh my goodness. and not their own. And so they're stuck in this gridlock pattern of sort of looking over their shoulder it's for helping mom and dad. And it sounds virtuous and it sounds lovely, right? Because you, you worry about your mom and dad and they worry about you, but it creates this reciprocal sort of stuck of worry and anxiety. So okay, I, I get it, but you know, somebody just typed in here. Well, if the parents need to hold it together for their kids, where are we supposed to get our outlets? So what I'm hearing you say is that if a parent 
can regulate their own anxiety around anything, then that will have a better outcome for whatever's going on with their child. However, some adult parents for all the love and, 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 and effort in the world can't seem to regulate, th- regulate their anxiety. Can you fake it till you make it or does a child pick up even on the faking? So I am not one who believes you can put a whole bunch of cosmetics on a zit, on an emotional zit, on acne. Well, you remember when we were in high school and you had a pimple and you put on five inches of Oxy-10 and all your friends were looking at you like, they don't see the pimple, but they see they see five inches of cover up. So I don't believe that you can do that. Just fake it till you make it. But here's what I think is important, Adrian. First of all, if it took, let's say, three generations of anxiety passing down to a family to land in our lap. You know, I'm a dad with three kids. I I have my red hot buttons too. So if it took three or four or six or 10 generations for me to be programmed to get anxious in very specific ways with my children, how long is it going to take me to regulate my own anxiety and learn the tools to be a calmer presence to my three boys than my father was to me? So some people might say, I have colleagues of mine, let's say more in the behavioral world, who say, "Eh, you can maybe do it in a weekend. I'm not so sure. I I think that um, if parents walk into this with the idea of, I'm going to make a project out of myself, not my kid, meaning that the focus is going to be on me. I am the project. My child is not the project. I am the project. Okay. Then it's a lifelong process. You know, I'm not a Freudian, but Freud did say this. The, the process of dealing with one's unconscious processes is a lifelong process. It doesn't yeah. happen over a weekend. And so, look, I, I, I have empathy for the parents who are saying, okay, this is all nice, but you know what? My kid's going to university next week and they're having panic attacks. It still comes down to the same thing. The That's more tough. emotional worry and focus you put on your child and the less you focus on What is your part in this reciprocal dance of anxiety? The less you keep the focus on you and the more you focus on your kid, your kid will generally do worse every single time. And I know parents who are listening to this going, it can't be that way. It just can't be that way because it feels loving when you focus on your child. Can can I just share a quick little story with you, Adrian? Yes, as long as you promise me that after this story, you're going to give us some tools for regulating our anxiety, short of like all, you know, taking a year off and to lie on a couch somewhere and work on ourselves. There's got to be some tools to help us self-regulate. Sure. Tell me the story and then we're going to talk about that. I was a single guy in Vancouver and a rabbi came in, a Chabad rabbi. He focused on marriage or relationships, I forget. And the room was full. It was about, you know, 80 people, single people. And so he was talking to us, how do you date and how do you pick a partner? And and so as he's talking, he walks over to a guy. It was great. The way he did this was wonderful. He walks over to a guy and he's talking. He's talking, Adrian, and he holds the guy's hand. Again, they don't know each other. He he just very casually puts his his hand on the guy's hand and he's talking and he's talking and then he stops. It was wonderful. He stops and he turns to the guy and he goes, repeat what I just said. And the the guy's like white, like a ghost. And he goes, you couldn't hear anything I just said, could you? And the guy was like, no, why? Because because you were holding my hand and it was super, super awkward, right? (laughs) I just kept thinking, why is this rabbi with a big beard holding my hand? And he goes, right. And it's the same thing. And his message was, it's the reason why you don't want to get too physical when you're dating, because as soon as you get physical, you're not able to really reveal character and, uh, you know, the, the, the deep emotions and, it's the same thing with, with anxious focus. If my mother or my father is anxiously focused on me, for whatever the reason is, I can't focus on what I need to do, oh whether I'm 14, 19, <laughs> 34, 52. I can't focus on what I need to do to tap into my strengths and do what I need to do to solve my problems. And one last point, Adrian, I think it's very oh. important. I think was did I make a mess? I'm just okay. Just a public service announcement. Sorry, kids, to my children. Just sorry. That's all. Okay, go ahead. Look, Not that they're Adrian, watching. Adrian, you know we're all work in progresses. I mean, I I don't. You you show me a parent, by the way, who's figured this all out. I want to co-write that book with them because I'll finally make a killing. 
on that <laughs> book. I mean, I, I don't know parents who who hit it out of the park all the time. Okay, I, I work with real human beings, you know, people who love their kids, but but who are engaged in a process of um, really trying to prevent the repetition of what they saw in their family and what their parents saw in their family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, you know what you said you I'm going to stop here because I think that you wanted to pivot to other questions or, or comments where do you want I to go do, with this? And I, but be, you know I mean I I love that story by the way I, I love that story and the whole as you were speaking I'm thinking this guy's probably freaking out because this dude's holding his hand and he doesn't hear a word he said right and I can see the equivalent of that with our children give me a couple of tools or ideas but you know do them through one of the questions okay so let's do that because I sure I know people want to be heard. Um, well, interesting, because you just related this. How do you keep your teens from stressing with college applications when that's all anyone talks about? Parents are almost as bad as their children, their teens. Yeah. So I heard a colleague say something once, Adrian. I never heard this term before, and I just think it's a wonderful term. I use it all the time now. And I'm, I'm not going to reference what she was referring to, but I'll just say the term. Okay. She called what I was discussing a collective psychosis, a collective psychosis when everyone is crazy. You know, I, ha I happened to work many years ago on an early psychosis team. And when you have someone who's in a state of psychosis, okay, and they're talking to their friend on the wall or whatever, you, you, there's no reasoning. You know, you, you might want to say to them, uh, you, know, you know, a green therapist would try to, you know, rationalize that there's no one you know, in the corner of the ceiling that you're speaking to, you realize very quickly that's not going to go anywhere because the person sitting there is going, you don't, you don't hear me what I'm trying to tell you right now. There's no rationalizing that. When you have an entire culture in a collective psychosis, right, it's very tricky. So when you say all parents are worried about this and you know we read that we're not going to get into the details but that thing in hollywood where you know hollywood uh, actors and actresses were paying universities to accept their exactly. that's what i would refer to as a collective psychosis meaning that it's a it's a it's a swirling anxiety and and by the way god bless these parents i mean they're in it right this it brings up a lot of stuff what i would say though is that first of all, to recognize that part of this is a collective anxious process and you get an option whether to partake or not. Meaning that you have to, first of all, check in with yourself in terms of, if I go onto a Facebook group for parents who, whose kids, I don't know, whatever, let's make this up. A, a group of you know parents whose kids are trying to get into Yale, for example, and it's just reams and reams of people complaining and tutors they're getting and all this kind of stuff. And you get off, you, you know, you get off the Facebook group and your blood pressure is whatever, and your heart rate's 120 and you can't think straight. Okay. That was not of assistance to you as a parent to your child, who's probably also anxious. The role of a parent is to dial down the anxiety to help your child think through their own problems. That's number one. And if you can't do that, right, then you have to move the focus more on to do I even know when I'm anxious? Do, we, do you even know when you're not a resource to your own kid? A lot of parents don't know. You know, Adrian, when I sometimes have a parent and a child in my office, I'll ask the child two questions every time. The, the questions are this. Number one, when is your mother most helpful to you? Number two, when is she not? Wow. And if the anxiety in the clinical room is low enough, the kid will say something like this. They'll, first of all, they'll look at their mother and they'll look at me and they'll say, look, my mom is not helpful to me when she tells me 20 times to do X, Y, and Z. You know, and the mother will laugh, right? And then the kid, you know, the, um, the kid will say, my, but my mother was helpful to me three weeks ago when she did X, Y, and Z. They, they know, they know, the kids know. And generally, it's always when, when my parent is not anxiously focused on me, I do better. And when my parent is anxiously focused on me, I do a little bit worse. I want to get away from that. Number two, I think it is very important to ask yourself this question as a parent. Are you oriented towards tolerating pain for growth? Say that again. Are you oriented towards tolerating pain for growth? So for example, Adrian, I'm going to own something here. I'm going to admit this in front of how many people are listening, but I'm just going to be honest here. I am someone that orients myself towards comfort. 
versus pain. Meaning, if you give me two choices, I, I told you this before our call today, my wife at the beginning uh, this morning, oh no, you weren't there, it was with Judy. Um, I told Judy today, my wife woke up this morning, said, Avram, why don't we take the kids and go kayaking? And I thought to myself, I'd rather have a root canal. Thank you very much. Because to, <laughs> I have three boys, 10, seven, and four. And to put the kayak on the car and get in the car and go, I'd rather sit and watch paint dry than do that. But you know what, Adrian? I knew this. I'm, I'm honest. I knew this call was happening tonight. And I thought to myself, can I tolerate pain for growth? So it was painful with the kayak and my boys fighting. But you know what? It was the best afternoon once we got out on that lake, Humber River, right? And did that kayak. The pain was worth the growth of the experience with my boys and to come back and it was painful again with the kayak coming back. I am not oriented towards that. But as a North Star, if I keep asking myself that question, am I tolerating the pain for growth in different areas of my kids' lives? Okay. It's always a good path to be on. Okay, so let's call that a tool. Let's that call that tool, fundamental tool number one, is to make a commitment to yourself to go against your grain if you are not the sort of person that tolerates pain for growth and to say to yourself, I am willing to do hard things. I can do hard things. I can do things that go against my grain in the interest of growth, my own growth. The second tool is to, when you're feeling hyper anxious about your child or someone else, is to second, the second tool would be to turn the attention onto yourself. In other words, if you're feeling something that is say above three out of 10 on the stress o meter, that you might say to yourself, I have a role in this somehow. I need to take first a look at myself so that I can reduce my own anxiety in order to be able to be of assistance even passively to my child. So those are two things that you can do when you feel yourself spiraling out of control. Give me another thing that you can say to yourself or do that can help put this willingness to because I think anxiety, I don't know if it's Freud or Jung, I can't remember who said it, that said that neuroses is always a pale imitation of suffering, genuine suffering. Do you remember who said that? That people who weren't willing to suffer, I think it was Jung, you're not willing to suffer, so you develop neuroses to cover up the original wound. So I wonder if anxiety is another way of not wanting that pain that can lead to growth trying to push it off. Well, look, I think it's, you know, Adrian, um, I really do believe this is a family of origin thing. And what I mean by that is either you grew up in a family where you saw your parents tolerate pain for growth spiritually, financially, in their marriage, or you grew up in a family where your parents oriented towards comfort over growth. And this is where, you know, you get into debt because you spent, you, you know, you, 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 you regulate your emotions by spending, eating, uh, having an affair. You know, there, there's, you, we, we grow up in two families, really, when you think about it. And, and, uh, and yes, it's a continuum. But generally, you either grow up in a family where you heard your parents on principle make decisions and tolerated pain for growth, or you grew up in a family where generally your parents oriented towards comfort over pain and you never really developed the skills. For those of us who grew up in families where there was more comfort over pain, it's going to take a lot of work. So here's my third tool for you. Now, I love this one. I do this, by the way, for myself every day. It's something I recommend to my clients as well. And, and by the way, for your listeners, we can I can send some data and some research about what I'm going to share with you now, because it's going to sound trite, but I think it's actually quite deep. Okay. I call this keeping a prediction journal, a prediction journal. And this is how it works. I'm the general type, idea, sorry? I'm just going to type that into the chat. The first. general idea, Adrian, goes something like this. The more anxious we are, the, the, the poorly we are at predicting our own experience in life and those we love. So the more anxious we are, we assume the experience is going to be like this, or we assume the person we're getting together with is going to do X, Y, and Z, and we're wrong. And then what happens is because we predict wrong, we act as if it's true. And then we create a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then we go, I'm right. But you weren't right. You, you predicted wrong. You acted on that wrong prediction. And then your kid is actually rebelling. And then you're thinking, ah, the problem is in you. So here's what you do. You take a journal and you take a pen. And let's say, I'm going to, Adrian, I'm going to throw this out here. Okay. So someone's listening to this call and they think, oh, 
this, this guy, this guy Avram's talking about making a project of myself. Okay, big shot. I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it next weekend. My kid is my, my kid has to submit um, his college application for uh, for Harvard or something. Generally, what I do is I sit down with a cup of coffee and I hover over them and I watch them to make sure they submit their application on time. Let's say that's what they do, right? And then we get into a fight because my my son always tells me I don't like when you're breathing over my back. Okay, so I'm going to make a prediction. I'm going to predict that I I am not. So you, you write this down. I am not going to hover over my child at 10 a.m. and I predict they won't do their application. That's my prediction. They're not going to do their application. And you and then what you do is you write a quick sentence. Just why? Just you know, share with your reasoning. And the reasoning is because if I'm not hovering over them. They're going to be a bum and they're not going to do it. And you write it. And then you, you do, Adrian, you take your journal, you shut it, okay? And you go about your life. And then Sunday comes, right? And then you observe. You shut your mouth, you become a scientist and you observe the process of what happens in your home. And then you open your journal on Sunday night and you write down your observation. Now, yeah. your observation might be correct. My son smoked weed all day and played Nintendo. Ha, Avram's a jerk. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I win. Good, good for you. And you're right. And what did you learn? Or, ha, huh, my son did sleep in, but at 12.15, without me getting in the way, he worked on his application for his university. What in the world was that about? And you write that down. And what did you learn? And what I have my clients do is I, I have them do this daily. Daily, meaning that you're always looking for ways to make predictions in your life watch what happens, come up with a couple of reasons why it happened that way. And what happens is it's the old, um, I don't know, Adrian, if it's Shakespeare or Voltaire, know thyself. The prediction journal gives real time feedback in terms of how accurate are you with your predictions about your marriage and your kids and this. And, and you don't have to need a therapist for this because the feedback happens in the moment. It's a wonderful little tool. If you can wow. keep up the habit, it's a habit though. It's like exercise. You got to do it on a regular. So That's there's tip number idea. three. Look, we've run out of time, but I can't leave without asking you about the stress that we are all experiencing with this huge rise in anti-Semitism that we are seeing, you know, uh, triggered by what's going on in the Middle East, but manifesting itself in the streets of our cities. And it can be very crazy making. It can make a fever pitch. And when something is about your identity, you know, it's very anxious provoking. Do the same principles apply even in a situation like this? Yeah, I mean, again, principles, if, if, if a principle is a real principle, it should be rock solid for any scenario. Now, the one principle we haven't spoken about here tonight, we might have mentioned it in the previous talk from a year ago, is open systems versus closed systems. Very briefly, an open family system is one where Adrian, you go home and you know, and I mean, when you know, you know in your guts, you know in your brain, you could tell your mom or your dad or your brother anything. They might get mad. They might not approve of your thought, but you won't get rejected, kicked out of the house, scorned, belittled. That's an open system. Okay, that's an open system. And you know it when you grow up in it. Most of us did not grow up in pure open systems. We grew up in closed systems. What's a sure. closed system? Don't, when, you're, when your Zadie comes over tonight for Shabbat dinner, don't you dare share what you learned in that college class of yours. You'll kill them, right? Yeah, <laughs> right? That's a closed system. Or I'm going to tell you something, but don't tell dad because he'll be furious with me. That's a closed system. Mm -hmm. So what does this have to do with anti-Semitism? And just the anxiety around that. Number one, either kids know they can come home and share whatever is on their mind with their parents, or they don't, or they don't. And so then they go into Reddit or 4chan online, all these online anonymous groups and have their discussions there. So either you, you foster an environment, especially, you know, if you have kids who are 18, 19, 20, and they're coming home with some pretty interesting ideas from school. How do you regulate your anxiety when your kids have a different idea than yours about Israel, about anti or about going to a march that you don't think is safe and they don't care because they have to go out and have advocacy for the, you know. So the, the idea here is that open systems change depending on the age of the child. Now, Adrian, I'm going to say something here 
uh, I, I, it has to be said, um, I was very active in advocacy in the, in the uh, early 90s in the Jewish community in Montreal. I never feared for my physical safety, never feared for my physical safety. I don't think that's true what I've seen over the past couple of weeks. So I have to say, if a parent said to me that they are not comfortable going to marches based on what they're seeing, um, I could appreciate that. I think the number one role of a parent is, and, and, and I mean this not just as a parent, as human beings, but animals, is to protect your young. So mm. I think the first thing is physical safety. We have to protect ourselves as a family first. Community would be second. It's first, you know, you have to sit down and you have to think, how can I protect my kids? So I, I think that has to be said. I think physical safety is something I'm not so sure we spoke about in the early 90s. It is now. Uh, barring that, again, you know, uh, to have these open conversations with family members who have different opinions and for the kids to know that there is no wrong idea and that we will all be okay, even though we might share different thoughts about this. And if you're anxious, you can say it. And if you're not anxious, you can say it. And, and the bedrock of our family will be, you know, a, a source of strength for all of us. Oh, Avram, I'm so sorry that I have to say goodbye now. We've, you know, we're, we're over and I could talk to you for, you know, the next 20 years. I'm going to ask you before I wrap this up, if you would consider writing down um, and sending a, a message to Judy or I about how that journal works so that we can send it out to all the registers on this call. Because I think a couple of people wanted a little bit more clarification on that. But sure. Um, I, I thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a very necessary conversation and maybe a little anxiety provoking, but you know, you start with yourself, right? So thank you. And, and I hope we get to chat again in the future very, very soon. Thank you, Evram. Thanks for having me. So everybody, we're taking a break for Memorial Day. But please make sure to join me on our next boost, which is Monday, June the 7th at 8 p.m. But right now I ask you a favor. There's a little poll that's gonna come up on your screen. And the truth is, is that it helps us ensure that we give you the kind of programming and the kind of you know, input that, that you're looking for. So please take the moment, fill it out. That would really help us. But from myself, Adrian Gold Davis, and all of us from your Momentum family around the world, Please remember, as we learn and we grow together and we learn to manage our anxiety together, that the highest form of wisdom will always be kindness. Good night, everyone.